Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm here today with Richard Rosen to talk about his new book, Yoga by the Numbers. And Richard is a longtime yoga teacher coming up on 36 years of teaching yoga. He was also a longtime contributing editor to Yoga Journal, and he's the author of five previous books, including two books on pranayama, original yoga and yoga FAQ. So he's, and he's joining us from his home in Berkeley, California. So welcome, Richard. It's great to be here with you. Thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here with you too. And thank you so much for writing your book, Yoga by the Numbers. <laughs> what yeah. a great concept. I've thought about that many times over the years, how great it would be to have one place where all the numbers and the symbolism and the significance of numbers in yoga were gathered. So thank you for writing it. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I thought we could start by just sharing if there's uh, for the viewers who may not be familiar with your work, if you could share a little bit about your yoga background, um, yourself, your writing. Well, I started practicing uh, 1837. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> in, in 1980 at the, at the yoga room in Berkeley, which at that time was just about the only yoga school in the East Bay. There may have been one or two others, but the yoga room was probably the, the main one. And I entered a, a teacher training program uh, two years after that at the Iyengar Yoga Institute in San Francisco. And that took me two and a half years to finish. Um, and then I, in 1987, I co-founded a, a yoga school in, in Oakland, Piedmont Yoga uh, Studio with my good friend, Rodney Yee. And that, that lasted for maybe 25, 26 years. Um, and I, as you said, I've written um, six books. Um, uh, I, 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 never, I wrote for Yoga Journal for many years. I, I did reviews, um, book reviews, and a, a lot of video reviews. I, I at one time had the largest collection of videos in the universe. They were all over the place. They, they sent me six or six or eight at a time, and I, you know, I, I got I, I got to keep all of them. Um, and um, I um, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's about twenty years ago, which which has affected my my life, of course, and my practice quite a bit over the years. Although I've been very fortunate, it's been a really slow progressing uh, condition. And it doesn't help that I'm, I'm old, too. I'm getting older anyway. I'm, I'm almost 75 now. I actually think those reviews that you wrote for Yoga Journal, that was the first place I remember becoming familiar with you as a, as a writer and as a teacher. And, um, and of course, we've known each other for, for several years. Right, right, right. So what was um, your purpose in writing the book, Yoga for <clears throat> Yoga by the Numbers? Well, I was inspired by a book that uh, my, my, my late friend Georg Furstein wrote called Spirituality by the Numbers. And I, I'm not going to say that I wrote a book as good as, as Georg's, but um, my purpose was to satisfy my own, my own curiosity about numbers in yoga. Um, little did I know how many numbers there were. I should have learned my lesson in, in FAQ when I when I bit off more than I can chew, and I did the same thing with this. And there, there's just there's just a bunch of numbers that I that I couldn't include in the book. Um, I, I took out the numbers that I thought were most important, zero through ten, and um, you know stuck in some other ones that were that were also very important in in, in, in yoga practice, like eighty four and one hundred and eight, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, it's, it's something I always enjoy doing is writing writing for people that. To um, you know, to 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 show what's below the outward appearance, and also to make people happy, and make them smile. Right, right, right. So, um, how do you hope that people will use this book? Like, should we read it from beginning to end, or go to certain sections? Just pick a number. I mean, you could do it that way, or I mean, it, it's not it's not exactly con uh, con um, consecutive throughout the, through the chapters, but. Um, it, 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 you, can, you can read it straight through if you want, or it's more, it's more like a reference book to see what these numbers uh, mean um, in, in general. Yeah, and it's, it's organized by topic too. So I guess if you right. wanted to know more about mantra, <clears throat> you could go to that, to that section. It, or... was originally, it was originally organized by number, chapter one, two, three, four, and so on. It had, was dedicated to that number, but mm -hmm. um, my editor at Yoga Journal did, uh, Yoga Journal, at uh, Shambhala didn't think that was a good idea. But the only thing that I really wanted out of that was I had a chapter zero, which I thought was really great. 
<laughs> well, you do spend a fair amount of time on zero before we get to one in the, well, the, in the first chapter. Yeah. It's a very interesting story about how zero was, was, was discovered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I learned, I'm learning, I learned so much um, by reading this book and that, that was one thing I had never read about zero. It's fascinating. Well, the interesting thing is that the Indians uh, invented zero, I guess you'd say. And the, 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 the speculation is that they were the only culture that could do that because they, uh, other cultures were afraid of zero because it was nothing to them. But for, but for, but for, the, but for, uh, but for yogis, that was what they were trying to accomplish was nothingness, zero. Right. So that, you know, the Indians are quite comfortable with, with, the, with the concept of nothing. Right. Fascinating. So one of the topics um, that really interested me was your discussion of monism, dualism, and triadism for the numbers one, two, and three. Right. So could you explain a little bit more about what those terms mean and why they're so um, significant for us in yoga? Yeah, um, this is gonna be a, an enormous oversimpl oversimpl oversimplification. Uh, so you, you, that, I have to put that caveat in there first. So uh, monism or oneness posits the entire universe, as the name implies, is unified in a single source, which is usually called Brahman. Uh, the philosophy that tries to explain this vision is called Vedanta, of which there are several schools with differing perspectives. But in general, um, Vedanta tells us we have been, are now, and always will be joined to, the, to this source through our personal self, which is called Atman. Brahman is then known as the Paramatman, and uh, our, our personal self is called the Jivatman, the living self or the embodied self. The image sometimes used to um, illustrate this relationship is the hand. You see the fingers, they're all separate, but they're all joined to the palm. So, you, you know, all this diversity is, is, is brought together in the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the fingers, uh, diversity then uh, may be thought of, as, in some of the schools are thought of as purely illusionary, diversity that is. It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a projection on this bl blank screen of Brahman. But in other schools, diversity is illusory as long as you believe that that's, that's, that's the actual state of the universe. When you, when you see the underlying, um, underlying unity of, of everything, then diversity still exists, but it now takes a back seat to the unity. Um, uh, and this means that when we look at our fellow humans, we should see ourselves in them. They're, they're a mirror for us, which is sometimes, of course, difficult to do with some people. But, you know, um, uh, Vedanta wants us to understand that we all, we all have, we all, in essence, we're all the same, the same, uh, the same. Um, dualism is um, the way we naturally experience the world. I'm me and everything else is not me. So it's very common, it's very, it's very, um, it's very, um, how can I say this? It's very obvious why there's a, there's a, there's a, a philosophy of dualism. Um, but this philosophy posits that the universe consists of two eternally um, separate existence, which is, which, well, in, in Sanskrit are called Purusha Prakriti, but we can just call them the self and matter. And those separate, these two must nevertheless cooperate if the universe is to exist. So the self provides the illumination, the, 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 the vision, and uh, matter provides what's being seen and the, the means for, for which um, consciousness can, can see things, can see the universe, eyes, eyes and ears and, 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 what, and all those organs. But since the two are su supposed to be entirely separate, explanations of how they manage to cooperate to create the universe are rather they're not always very convincing. Um, and so basically what it comes down to is they say, this is the way it's always been. And they really don't try to explain that, that the, um, the, the paradox of two separate entities co cooperating to create the universe. Um, so in the dualist world, there's no common source as there is in, in, in the Vedanta. There's no Brahman over, overarching source. And instead, it's it's passively observed by a a, um, a, a special self called um, called um, Ishvara. And what makes Ishvara special is that it's never been in in contact with matter before, so it's never it doesn't have any means of uh, 
contacting contacting the world. It, it's just separate from and observes things from the distance. Um, so um, Ishvara acts as a kind of a meta yogi uh, that it serves as a sort of model for all the other yogis and uh, the way they should the way they the way should they they should live their lives as being very withdrawn from matter, very changeless and very and very passive. And yoga in this context, in the dualist context, doesn't mean union. It means it means meditation, because there is no final union in 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 dualist pr practice. Um, in fact, what 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 classically uh, classic yoga is called is is v yoga means disunion, because the idea behind the practice is to withdraw the self from its association with matter. Um, and this is done through. Um, uh, why people want to why people want to do this is that when you're associated with matter you you're sort of taken over by matter and you associate yourself with matter and that becomes your identity and that that sort of isolates you from your true self which creates existential suffering which the yogis try to uh, um, overcome by separating themselves out from from matter um and then um the, the final state of that of that practice is called kaivalya which means um aloneness um let's see and what about triadism well that's 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 really interesting because it's sort of a combination of both the previous two it there's an overarching uh unity but uh diversity is an expression of that unity and unity brings all the diversity together and i think that's probably the you know the most interesting way for, to look at the world that we're all different but we're all the same at the same time. Mm -hmm. So would that be um, <clears throat> more how the like the non-dual tantric schools that yeah. they're they're yeah. starting That's very point? Shaivism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shaivism. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I'm just curious to know, in terms of your um, experience in yoga over so many years and your personal practice, um, do you feel particularly aligned with one of these worldviews or the other? And and how does that affect? <laughs> what you practice and what the aims of your practice are or how has that evolved over the years? Well, I'm certainly in contact. I, I, I'm, I'm most associated with, um, with triadism, with, with being, tri the, the triad is Shiva, Shakti, and me. And Shiva Shakti is a, um, you know, is, is a two in one a, a deity. Shiva is the masculine, but the passive principle. And Shakti is the feminine active principle. She's the creator. And Shakti is the observer, or Shiva is the observer. So in my practice, I try to do, I try to balance out um, action and, and, and observation. I think in modern yoga, the, the, it, it's way too much to, uh, it, 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 the emphasis is too much on uh, action and on, on doing. And I think it's really important to, to put in some, uh, some, 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 some just being, some, some just watching. Mm -hmm. So I try to balance out those two factors in my practice. Um, uh, what else? Oh, I wanted to talk about all those yamas and niyamas. Yeah. Because I was so surprised yeah. Yeah. to learn. You're right. There's over 160. And that was kind of an informal survey yes. that you did. Um, so I think people will be really surprised to learn that because so many people think of just the five Yamas right. and five niyamas in the Yoga right. Sutras. Um, and maybe we know of other qualities or other virtues in yoga, but haven't considered them as yamas and niyamas, you know, like the list at the beginning of chapter 16 in the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, some and, and in the Hatha Yoga Pratipika and so many other places. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. And you mentioned how, you know, some of them like, abandoning public contact <laughs> isn't yeah. really applicable yeah. um, anymore exactly. to the way that yoga practitioners um, live our lives. But I think there are so many others like generosity and self-study and celebration that can really be so useful in guiding us in, in how we practice yoga today. And I particularly loved the, the one that you brought out at the, at the end of that little section, the desire for the good of the world and service. Yeah. That's the one that, that I think is most important of them all. I mean, all the others I think are, are contained in that one, 
in that one uh, um, behavioral injunction. And that is, you know, to do your work for the good of yourself and the world in, at, at the same time. And, and I think that's, I think, I think everything else falls into place in, 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 into that one yama, yeah. that one desire. Where did that one appear? You can find it in the, uh, it's called the Uddhava Gita. Ah, okay. And it's also found in the Mahabharata. And it's also found in uh, the, the, um, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, it's called, it's called, um, what is it called? Gita it's called Icha. I Isa well, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's called Loka Sambraha. Uh, ah, okay. Sarva, B Sarva Bhuta I I Iha. In the in the Uddhava Gita, I believe right. I can't quite remember, but yeah, um, I think I pulled all of those out from. I I have a the best reference book is it's Georg's book on uh, uh, Encyclopedia of Yoga and Tantra, and I just went through all the the whole book and pulled out all the all the yamas that he that he that he included. And it's it's really an amazing book, and if you do a lot of research into yoga, you really have to have this book. The the Encyclopedia of Yoga. Tantra. Okay, our first team. Yeah. So that that's an interesting question also because, and I don't know if maybe he goes into it in his book, but um, given that the original texts where these yamas and niyamas appear um, typically don't say much about how to practice them. Yeah. You know, they say what they are, but not how to how to cultivate them or how to put them into our how to how to bring them into um, our lives. So. I'm curious to know if you have any advice for us about how we can make sense of them for ourselves today by still and and still honor the original spirit, right? And you know, you gave a clue in saying maybe this you know desire for the good of the world, yeah, um, is is one kind of overarching concept that can inform how we make sense of them for ourselves. It's really hard to know what the original intent of a lot of these. Yamas and yamas were, especially the the ones in the in the in the um, yoga uh, uh, the um, yoga sutra. A lot of them are, have been reinterpreted for modern consumption. So, right. for example, purity now is just you know you just sort of take a bath and things like that. But originally, it was you know you just you stayed away from other people you, you, and you just didn't really um, um, care much for your body because that it, it was seen as sort of polluting the, the self. So it's really hard to know what a lot of times what the original intent was. Although um, the, the, the yamas and the yamas and the yoga sutra were, were, were intended for a specific purpose, and that is to get you ready to meditate. Right. Whereas, uh, whereas now I think modern yoga is 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 not a is not a practice of withdrawal. In fact, I think modern yoga you want to dive into life a little bit more deeply. And you know the the yamas and the yamas the the yamas and niyamas the behavioral injunctions. Are you know uh, you can interpret them um, in 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 the context of what 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 good they can, what good will, will come of them how how you, how they can help yourself and other people I mean I I can't really be more specific than that I, I have enough trouble doing it for myself but I think yeah. you know I think people can I think people if if uh, well um, good hearted people can understand what what needs to be done when when they see these things. And I think that is a really useful marker. If I think, will this action or will this way of, of interacting or being be beneficial for myself and everyone else and the yeah, planet, that's, right? That's a, we exactly. Could, that's that's yeah. a consideration. Yeah, that's modern yoga for you, which yeah. is a lot different than the tradition. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah. And that, that's one of the reasons I think those perspectives, the monism, dualism, dualism, and triadism are so important for us to kind of understand and make sense of, you know, if, if we're dedicated practitioners, um, because it I guides think, what we're going for, actually. I think the most important thing about Vedanta is that you see yourself in other people. Hmm. That's something I try to do all the time, which, you know, when somebody double parked in front of me on the, on the road, it's hard to, re it's hard to see myself in that person. I get really... Right. Irritated, but um, I, I try to I, I try to do that, especially with my students. Mm. Um, I went to a psychic once. It's really not my thing, but my wife convinced me to go. And it, what he said, well, he said one thing that was really uh, uh, interesting to me. He said, "You're not working with people's bodies; you're working with people's souls." 
Mm. So when 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 my students come into the into the room, I, I try to see them as 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 that rather than just a physical body. That's great teaching advice. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> So at the end of chapter six, which um, that's the chapter called Hatha Yoga by the Numbers, uh, right. you write, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a, a little passage here. You write, obviously, our world and the yogi's world are very different places, as are the practices we favor. As a consequence, the traditional stages of yoga aren't much used to us, except historically, as looks into the early centuries of Hatha Yoga. They do nevertheless teach us three important lessons. <clears throat> First, yoga is always changing and it's up to us to make sure it always does so for the better. So I wanna look a little bit at that first lesson and there's two parts um, that I see in it. Yoga is always changing. So from your perspective as someone who's been um, you know, in the Western yoga world for so many decades, how, um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, yoga is always changing in the context of the question, "Who am I?" That's 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 the that's the the thread that runs through all of that. That's that's a major issue in most yoga schools, and probably pretty much all of them actually. The question is, "Who am I?" and how do I find out who that is? Um, but um, my feeling is that consciousness is is a continual state of of, of unfolding. Consciousness is looking at itself through us, and um, um, it, it it it's it's eternally curious about itself and fascinated with itself, as we should be ourselves. So, um, I think the answer to the question "Who am I?" is 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 is, is mystery is a shrouded in mystery, um, and it. Uh, uh, um, scientists or thinkers have tried for many thousands of years to figure out what consciousness is and they can't really do it to anyone's satisfaction to everyone's satisfaction and i think the reason for that is is that consciousness doesn't want to be known what it doesn't want to be known it wants us to keep looking for it in, through ourselves um so um it's a mystery that has more than one solution it's not like professor plum in, in the in the in the kitchen with the knife there, there's there's several different solutions to that problem, but they're all tentative at, because consciousness is continuously unfolding. So the the answer to who I am, the answer to who am I is continually changing as well. Um, uh, what else can I say? Um, so that's a, that's you're kind of talking about our how our experience of yoga is always changing depending exactly. on how we answer that question for ourselves and what we see when we ask that question. Well, well you can see if you look in the, in the history of yoga, uh, it's 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 developed at very various schools. Even within even within Vedanta, for example, there's different perspectives on how on, on what the world looks like to them. So uh, uh, yoga has been changing right along with consciousness all, uh, you know, since, since the beginning of, 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 of its, its inception. Um, and I think it's useful. I, I think it's, it, it's important that we also understand that we, our yoga has to change too as, as, as we go along, uh, as we get Can more- Can you say more about that? Yeah, and as, as you get more in tune with yourself, I think you, you know, at first you're, you're sort of doing what your teacher tells you to do. And you know, you, you go along with you know, it's like learning anything else. You you learn from somebody who's, who who knows a little bit more than you do. But in time, you become more um, you you become more um, uh, you you become more understanding about what you, yourself and what you need for yourself. And then your yoga becomes more personalized over time. And I think that's important to keep keep that keep that moving along as you as you get, as you as you get older. You know, more as you learn more about yourself for one thing. But as you get older too. You'll have your your yoga will inevitably begin to change because of the way your body is changing as you as you age. Right. Well, that actually um, brings me to the the second part of that first lesson that you talked about. Um, you know, it's up to us to make sure it always changes for the better. I really um, I really appreciate the sense of ownership that um, that is conveyed by that. That um, for me um, as a teacher and a dedicated practitioner, it's like we are all of us holders of, in a certain way of, um, 
of yoga and that there's um there's actually a responsibility in that in a Absolutely. in a certain way that we're part of um a lineage of teachers yeah. and students who have come before us whenever we're doing this practice um so we've we've inherited it to some degree even if we're doing postures that are very new you know if we call it yoga and we call ourselves yoga teachers that we've in, we've um in, inherited that um so what are the most important things that you feel um, teachers and dedicated students should keep in mind or, or do perhaps to, um, to uh, fulfill that responsibility, right? To make sure that yoga yeah. keeps changing for the better. Well, first of all, it's important to re recognize that yoga is more than just a few exercises that you do you know, in class a few times a week for an hour or two. What we call practice is also a preparation. And what I mean by that is that yoga is, a, is is basically all all of life. It's it's the epitaph epigraph, epigraph in in uh, Sri Aurobindo's book, the synthesis of yoga. All life is yoga. So I think you know you have to you have to think of your movements as asanas, your words as mantras, your your breathing as pranayama, and uh, and, and carry your witness around with you throughout the day so that you you you're continuously meditating as you go through your day. So yoga is life, and you have to really get out, get away from the idea that yoga is just you know a bunch of exercises or, or you know, what you do on a, on, a, on a sticky mat. The second, I also think it's important to realize that yoga is not a path, as it's often called, because that implies that you're going somewhere to get something. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think what the goal of yoga is right in the palm of your hand. It's it's hiding in plain sight, like you used to say. And all you have to do is look in yourself. And that, it's no, there's nowhere to go. You're the, you're already there, in essence. And then thirdly, um, as you say, um, we can't destroy yoga, but as Westerners have been sometimes accused of doing, because it's woven into the fabric of the universe and so in, into the fabric of our own being. But we can't distort it, as, as you were suggesting. And that's why the practice was originally, originally kept secret to keep it out of the hands of people who would misuse it for their own personal gain or power. But now the cat's out of the bag and um, it's completely unregulated by a, by a, by a, by a, um, um, a, a higher, a, a more a, a, a educated authority. And so um, it's easier now for people to knowingly or unknowingly misuse the practice. And I, so I think um, it, it's a double-edged sword, you know, um, whether you know you want to keep the practice pure, um, just uh, among a few people, or whether you want to just let it out, let everybody in, so that you know that you, you open yourself up to some issues in, in, in doing that. So a serious student, especially teachers, I think, should learn something about yoga's past to understand um, just what just uh, that we have responsibilities. You were saying to respect the tradition and to have a clear vision of what our our place is in it. So I think the study of, of text is really important for, 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 especially for teachers. Yeah, I agree. A lot of teachers um, tell me, because I do teach yoga philosophy and they say, I love studying yoga philosophy and I try as much as I can to bring it into my classes, but my students, they really just want the hour long right. vinyasa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> they, exactly I get right. it, you know, it's, um, I think, and I think it's something that over time as teachers, we start to bring just in who we are, you know, like what you were saying yeah. before, how viewing students um, as, as you, as part of you, or, uh, you know, there, there are other ways, I think, um, maybe less obvious, um, of bringing that in and kind of emphasizing the importance of seeing the bigger picture in in the ways you just mentioned. Well, well, Jung always says that you have to be right for the for, for what you for the teaching. So, I, I mean, you know, an average student. I mean, this is not a uh, this is not a, um, a criticism, but they they just they, they're not really right for that, that for that more intense philosophy teaching. And, but if you give them enough of what they want. They begin to get curious about what what's going on, and a lot of them just naturally start to ask questions about, you know, something, something behind what's going on, and they you know they get they start reading about more uh, about yoga in more detail, more historically and, and, and philosophically. 
That's a great point. Cause I think, and I think sometimes that comes from the student's own experience, right? They'll be doing the class for, for a few weeks or a few months, and then they'll start to feel better, you know, in more ways than just their body. They'll, they'll notice yeah. those changes. And, right. and sometimes that's the way a student will get curious yeah. and kind of yeah. ripe, as you say, for kind of a deeper understanding and context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great. Anything else you want to say to our viewers? I want to say this. The word asana is rooted in a little verb. It means to sit, as. But it also, but it also means to stay the course, to persist in a course of action, to be present, of course, and to celebrate, as you mentioned earlier. So I think, I, I think uh, we should think of our lives as a never-ending asana, which means that the world is your practice space. Uh, you celebrate your good fortune that you wandered in, wandered unsuspectingly into that first class, or were dragged there by your spouse or partner or friend, or um, and and that and, and that you should that you have stuck with it all this time. So I think you know I think you should really be very, very feel feel very fortunate that you have wandered into a yoga practice, and I think it's very important also to have fun. And if you're not having any fun, your practice is seriously flawed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just kidding about that, but it, it, you should, you know, I, I, I used to review videos for the Yoga Journal for many years, and they were always so grim when they were doing their practice on the video. And I think they, they wanted to project a, a, an aura of seriousness about what they were doing, and that's fine. You want to be serious about what you're doing, but in that seriousness, you want to have some enjoyment as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have some fun. Put the ha back in hata. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that on a t-shirt. Yeah, right. Really. <laughs> awesome. Uh, great. Thank you so much. What an encouraging note to end on, to be grateful. <laughs> just for, I hope so. Just for having happened upon your first yoga class. Yeah, really. I'm looking back. So thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. It was a Thanks pleasure for being be with, with us and all the best for great success with your, your new book and all your previous books, which I have in my library and I use and I recommend to others all the time. So thank you very much. Thank you for your um, great contributions to thank the you, world of yoga.